Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another colloquium in the uh, Spring Astrobiology Colloquium series. Um, today, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, who's Kathy Lunt. Um, she comes us, to us from the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Um, so Kathy is going to talk a little bit about her, her non-conventional background and in getting into science when she starts, so I won't spend too long introducing her. Um, but just to say that she got her PhD from uh, UT San Antonio in uh, ecology, science, ecological science, and engineering. Um, she then went on, I believe, to Swery, but maybe, no, actually, there's probably some other stuff in there. But I do know she was at Swery at one point working on different uh, spacecraft instrument teams, so she has that background. Um, she is primarily a planetary scientist with research expertise in planetary atmospheres. We're going to hear a little bit about um, that today. And uh, at the moment, at Johns Hopkins APL, she is the uh, AB section supervisor, so astrobiology section supervisor, as well as the planetary scientist, um, science chief scientist, um, tasked with starting an exoplanet program at APL. So she's obviously very interested to come and visit us today and talk about what we're doing here. But she is going to talk to us today about tracing formation and evolution of outer solar system bodies through stable isotopes in noble gas abundance. So, Kathy. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> and I want to thank you for having me here. It's really a wonderful opportunity to come and visit the University of Washington and to learn about your astrobiology program and learn about the research going on here. I'm ex I've especially been interested in the exoplanet research that you've had going on. Um, what I'm going to talk about is research that we've been doing for several years. I've been working with several collaborators. I didn't have enough space to put them all on here, so I called out the two who have contributed the most to this work. But this is work that has been really a team effort from spacecraft teams, from mission teams, and from other scientists with a lot of expertise in the formation and evolution of the solar system. And what I'm going to talk about is the acquisition and evolution of volatiles throughout the solar, or in outer solar system or outer solar system atmospheres. Before I do that, I wanted to introduce a myself a little bit more because I come from a very non-traditional background. When I first graduated from high school, I didn't really have the money to go to college, so I joined the military so that I could take advantage of the GI Bill and get money for college and then pursue my education that way. Uh, I joined the Navy and I wanted to be a nuclear physicist, but at the time that I joined, I'm going to date myself now, you'll find out I'm very old. Um, at the time I joined, women were not allowed to serve in combat or on combat vessels. And all of the nuclear reactors in the Navy were located on combat ships, so women were excluded from the nuclear physics program in the Navy. So I went for the next high-level academic uh, job program that they had and I became a Russian linguist. I stayed in the Navy for seven years, and then after having children, I got out and became a military spouse and traveled all over the world, living in places like Spain, Bulgaria, of course, sitting still for maybe a year and a half at a time. So it was very difficult to continue and complete my education. When we finally <coughs> settled down in San Antonio, I had completed a master's degree through distance ed through the University of North Dakota doing research on Mars geomorphology, where you can access these images from anywhere in the world. So I was living in Bulgaria. I could get on the internet, access NASA data. And I had a wonderful advisor who is now at the University of Oregon and was able to do research and publish it that way. So there are a lot of non-traditional opportunities out there. Once we settled into San Antonio, I started working at Southwest Research Institute and completed my PhD while I was working there, working on the Cassini data sets. So I have done a wide range of different science topics because I've taken advantage of whatever opportunities were available to me, and these were always connected to missions. So I've been very fortunate to be a part of many NASA missions and some European Space Agency uh, missions as well. Um, the topic that I'm going to focus on is my favorite one, which is the origin and evolution of volatiles in outer solar system atmospheres. And from that, I've worked on two different missions that have contributed a great deal to that, and that's the Cassini mission. I was on the mass spectrometer team for five years, and then I worked on the Rosetta ion electron spectrometer, but I worked with the mass spectrometer team for that. So I'm going to talk about both of these missions, and I'll talk uh, in more detail about the Rosetta mission because it's a really cool mission, and a lot of people don't know as much about it because it's a European Space Agency one. So... <laughs> The topic today is tracing the acquisition and evolution of volatiles in solar system bodies. 
And the goal for that is to connect the formation of the solar system with what we are observing today. So all of the measurements that we have that go into this research come from this time period in our evolution of the solar system. Um, and this graphic is one that NASA has produced to, as part of their education to um, introduce the formation of the, of the solar system, the formation process. It's a really good illustration. But all that we're able to do for our own solar system is take measurements that are in this very last stage. And what we want to do is connect those measurements to processes that were taking place in the earlier stages where, when the solar system was forming. And I'm going to talk about how we do that. So I'll first discuss how we use composition to trace the origin and evolution. And then I'll give some examples for work that we've done on Titan, Pluto, and Triton for two different constituents in their atmospheres. And then I'll talk about looking ahead to a hopeful future ice giants mission where we would want to know understand more about the formation of the ice giants. So we use composition as a tracer for origin and evolution by taking measurements in bodies in the solar system, primarily in atmospheres, but we also measure, take measurements in meteorites to try and understand asteroids, and then we also take measurements in comets as well, which are sort of an asteroid, but it's, or an atmosphere, but it's outgassing very quickly. Now, these measurements can be categorized in two different ways. They can either be primordial measurements, where they represent what the conditions were in the protosolar nebula when this body formed, or they can be evolved measurements. That means that the, the composition of what we're measuring has changed over the history of the solar system, and you can't exactly say that these measurements are representative of conditions in the protosolar nebula. So it, those two different categories are extremely important. This figure here is showing the measurements of the heavy elements that we know in the giant planets in our solar system. And the only one that is almost complete is Jupiter, and that's because we sent an atmospheric probe on the Galileo, Galileo mission to make in situ measurements of the noble gases. This is really the only way we know of to be able to measure the noble gases in the giant planet atmospheres. Uh, we do have carbon measurements for all four of the giant planets. That's the only ones that we have. We also have D-to-H observations for them as well. But these are the types of measurements that we use to try and compare what we see today with the conditions of the formation of the solar system. So what has primordial composition? What measurements can we use to say that this is representative or we think that it's representative of conditions in the protosolar nebula. The primary one is the sun, because the bulk, of, the bulk amount of the material in the formation of the solar system went into the sun. And so measuring the composition of the solar wind and the solar coronasphere, we can get an idea of what the bulk composition of that protosolar nebula was. Uh, the giant planets are atmospheres that are primary atmospheres. They acquired their atmospheres from the protosolar nebula, so they have a composition that traces the condition, the, the gas of the so protosolar nebula where they formed, but their composition also is influenced by icy bodies and rocky bodies that contributed to their formation, so they're not just pure protosolar nebula, but their composition is useful for understanding how they were formed and what their building blocks were. There's also comets, which formed in the outer solar system outside of the snow line, and they trapped volatiles and gases. And they are something of a time capsule for the conditions in the outer protosolar nebula when the, the planets were forming. And then closer in are asteroids, which formed more inside of the snow line. They may have captured some volatiles, but they're not as volatile rich as comets because of where they formed during solar system formation. So everything else has evolved in some way. The surfaces of moons have evolved due to weathering, the atmosphere of the Earth, the atmosphere of the terrestrial planets, the atmosphere of small bodies has, have all evolved. And what's important to understand is that all of these evolved atmospheres are also secondary atmospheres. So they may have captured a primary atmosphere from the protosolar nebula, but they were too small to retain this atmosphere, a, a hydrogen-dominated atmosphere. And then they outgassed material, which formed a secondary atmosphere that then evolved over time. 
And if we want to use measurements in these atmospheres to understand the conditions of their formation, then we need to understand how that atmosphere has evolved over the 4.6 billion year history of the solar system. In order to do that, we have models for connecting the past and the present. And it's a fairly simple equation. I'm not going to show a lot of equations during this talk. But we basically, to model the evolution of an atmosphere, we track the abundance of a constituent in the atmosphere over time, how that changes due to differences in production and loss processes. And these production and loss processes can be time dependent and time variable as well because the sun and the UV flux from the sun has changed over time. So we have to take that into account if we're going back far enough in time. Now we trace not just a constituent in the atmosphere, but we also trace its isotope. So if we look at N2 in an atmosphere, we look at 14N2, and then we also look at 14N15N, and see if there's a difference between production and loss rates for those constituents in the atmosphere and look at how that changes the isotope ratio, 15N to 14N, over time. And that helps us to figure out a few different things about how an atmosphere has changed over time, and then that allows us to connect it to the past. Now, any difference in the loss or production rate that is isotope selective is represented by a fractionation factor. If this fractionation factor has a value of 1, it means that there is no difference between the heavy and the light isotope, and there's no change over time in the isotope ratio due to that process. If the fractionation factor is less than 1, it means that there, in the case of a loss process, is a preferential loss of the lighter isotope. And that means, over time, the ratio will become heavier, or the, the abundance of the heavy isotope relative to the lighter isotope will increase over time, and that isotope ratio will change. If the fractionation factor is greater than 1, then that means the preferential loss of the heavy isotope, and the ratio becomes lighter over time. And I'll give some examples of both. Now, there's two processes that we've focused on because we understand them the most and we have the, be the best data for characterizing these processes in the planetary atmospheres that we have focused on. One of them is escape, which always makes the ratio lighter over time, or heavier over time, because it always preferentially removes the lighter isotope. This is a gravity-dominated effect and the heavier isotope is going to be affected less than the lighter isotope. Now, different types of escape will have different effectiveness on the, the way that the isotope ratio changes over time, but it's always going in one direction. Now, this example that I'm showing here is data from Cassini INMS. This is the N2 isotope ratio measured by the mass spectrometer as a function of altitude. And you can see with altitude above the homopause where atmospheric species separate according to their masses, the isotope ratio becomes lighter up until the top of the atmosphere where escape is happening because it's kind of an evaporation and the sputtering off of the top of the atmosphere. So what is being lost is, has a lighter ratio than the bulk of the atmosphere. Now I'm also showing here an example of photochemical fractionation in Titan's atmosphere where you can compare the HCN nitrogen ratio to the N2 ratio. And the HCN ratio has a much greater abundance of the heavy isotope in it, even though HCN is produced directly because of the photo dissociation of N2 and methane, leading to chemistry that forms HCN and then gradually builds into larger molecules that forms haze that's deposited on the surface. So this incorporation of nitrogen into HCN and higher order organics is a permanent loss from N2 of nitrogen atoms. And what happens is more of the 15N is removed from N2 because the photo dissociation cross-sections for N2 are very complex as a function of wavelength. They're, they're very highly structured as a function of wavelength. And there is an offset between the heavy isotopes cross-section and the lighter isotopes cross-section. So the lighter isotope is in black and the heavy isotope is in red. And what ends up happening in a thick atmosphere like Titan is photons that dissociate the heavier isotope can penetrate more deeply into the atmosphere to where that chemistry is happening to form HCN and dissociate more of the heavier isotope at those altitudes that are critical so that you end up with a very different ratio for HCN. 
And this process will change the ratio over time, making it lighter if it's effective for a long period of time. So these are the main processes that we have focused on. Now, when we model the evolution of the isotope ratio over time, the output that we get from the model depends on the input that we have available. So if we have an idea of what the primordial ratio would be, what the starting point was, then what we do is we look at the current ratio and that starting point and determine how long it would take to get from that starting point to what we measure today. And that gives us a time scale over which a process has been working in an atmosphere. And I'll give a, an example of some results for this for Titan's atmosphere in a moment. Now, if we don't know the initial ratio, but we do know the time scale, like the time scale is the lifetime of the solar system, 4.6 billion years, then what we can do is we can take a, a current measurement and track it backwards in time if we understand these processes and how they've been at work over time and get that initial ratio. And this is important for connecting current measurements to conditions in the protosolar nebula. I'll also, I'll also give an example of that. And in both cases, we can get the total inventory. So if we figure that there's been a lot of escape that has changed the ratio from one value to another, we can figure out how thick the atmosphere happened to have been at one time or must have been at one time, or how much methane was converted into higher order hydrocarbons to get that total inventory, and then compare it with volatiles that are deposited on the surface of a body. So now that I've given a background on how we use composition to trace origin and evolution, I'm going to talk about three atmospheres that we've been working on trying to understand through evolution of those atmospheres based on measurements that we have available. And that's Titan, Pluto, and Triton. After that, I'll give two examples of work that we've done. So Titan is Saturn's largest moon. It has a very thick atmosphere that is primarily N2, but there's about 5% methane at the surface and about 1.5% in the upper atmosphere. Its surface pressure is 1.5 bars, so it's thicker surface pressure than the Earth. The temperature and pressure conditions on the surface are such that a methane, a hydrologic type cycle of methane is able to take place, forming lakes on the surface of, the, of Titan and there's rainfall, and it, it, it's a completely different world, and it's very interesting. Now, Pluto and Triton also have N2-dominated atmospheres, but they aren't nearly as thick as the atmosphere of Titan. They also have methane, so there's chemistry that's taking place in their atmospheres that's similar to Titan, but the, the temperature conditions are much colder, and the, the pressure is much lower, so they're very different. Now, Pluto experiences a lot more changes because of its distance from the sun, it has a much more elliptical orbit than Triton. But Triton is located in the, the magnetosphere of Neptune, so it experiences interaction with Neptune's magnetosphere that is different. So there are similarities between all three of these atmospheres, but there are unique differences that gives them a lot of value. So for Titan, we understand that the most. We have the most data available because of the Cassini mission and a lot of, uh, a lot of data that was taken from multiple instruments of the atmosphere and of, uh, to try and understand the interior. And Titan has a secondary atmosphere. It's not a primary atmosphere. So its atmosphere was outgassed from the interior. There are two different theories on how that outgassing from the interior has taken place over time. One theory is that the outgassing has been ongoing over the entire history of Titan, which is assumed to be 4.5 billion years. And the other theory is that the outgassing has been episodic. This is showing an illustration of an interior model and how it's changed over time, and the, it's suggesting that there was a major outgassing event early on, midway through, and then more recently about uh, 500 million years ago. And this is just one of the theories for the outgassing of methane at Titan. One of the things that we want to do is see if we can use isotope ratios in the evolution of the, the atmosphere to differentiate between this model and the constant outgassing model. Now, we know even less about Triton and Pluto. There are suggestions from the New Horizons observations that Pluto may have had a subsurface ocean. So it's possible there was outgassing at Pluto, but we don't know enough right now. And then Triton is one of the leading 
uh, potential ocean worlds. And one of the driving forces behind sending an ice giant's mission to try and discover does it have a subsurface ocean like, uh, like Europa does and like Titan appears to as well. So those are more for future exploration. We know the most about Titan. Now we study the evolution of the N2 and the methane in Titan's atmosphere, and we've, we've started to look at Pluto's and we're starting to work on Triton as well for two different reasons. We look at the carbon isotope ratio in methane to try and figure out how long methane has been present in Titan's atmosphere and differentiate between those two different outgassing scenarios. And then we look at the nitrogen ratio in N2 to figure out what the primordial value was so that we can connect it to the conditions in the protosolar nebula and the original source of that nitrogen. And we use data from multiple spacecraft for this. We, we're primarily using data from Cassini for the Titan observations, but we're using data from New Horizons, from Rosetta, from Voyager, and from the Galileo probe for all of these explorations. Well, the Galileo probe is more for the giant planets, which is my last topic. So I'm first going to talk about the evolution of methane and how we use the evolution of it to try and figure out how long methane has been present. And in order to do that, we start with the current state of knowledge or the state of knowledge when we did this work. Um, we had measurements on the surface of the carbon isotope ratio from the Huygens probe. There was a mass spectrometer that measured the ratio to be lighter than in the Earth's atmosphere. And um, well, actually, this is the upper boundary that we used. It, it was lighter than the Earth's atmosphere, and this is what we determined based on measurements throughout the solar system was the upper boundary for the lightest that the isotope ratio could be. We had a whole bunch of measurements of the upper atmosphere from the mass spectrometer on the Cassini orbiter, and we wanted to figure out if that gr agreed with the surface observations, so we needed to do some atmospheric modeling to figure that out. Um, the escape rate there is still an ongoing debate about the escape rate of methane depending on what type of model that you're using for the atmosphere. Some are suggesting that methane is escaping hydrodynamically even though the N2 is showing that the atmosphere is, in, is hydrostatic and they're suggesting very high escape rates whereas other models are suggesting that the escape rate is two to three orders of magnitude lower and methane is not escaping very quickly. So, Instead of joining that debate and getting too involved, we just modeled the implications of each of those two escape rates to see what the implications would be for the time scale of methane. And then escape fractionation, we didn't know for certain, but we had observations that I showed you before of the isotope ratio as a function of altitude, not just for N2, but for methane's isotope ratio. And we used that to determine what the escape fractionation was so that we would have an actual measured value. So this is the data sets that we had. This is the carbon isotope ratio for 30 different flybys of Titan's atmosphere. The, this is the lower atmosphere measurements from the, the Huygens mass spectrometer, and then these are the measurements with the infrared spectrometer in the stratosphere. And we, can, we also use the nitrogen ratio to try and constrain the dynamics of the atmosphere. And from that, we got the information that we needed to be able to model the evolution of the atmosphere. And we used four different scenarios where we used our ratio extrapolated to the surface, which was quite a bit lower than the GCMS one. And then we used the two different escape rates. And you can see if you have a really high escape rate, then you end up with a very short time scale because you're just losing so much methane from the atmosphere and we measured the fractionation so we know it's going to be very effective. And you end up losing the rate, a lot of material and changing the isotope ratio very quickly over time, no matter how much production there is. With sputtering, you can get much longer time scales because the escape rates are much lower, even though the, the escape uh, effectiveness for fractionating is, is the same as hydrodynamic because we measured it. Now you can see each of these end at a certain point. What I'm plotting is production over loss. So we have a certain production rate that we assume to be ongoing that is relative to the loss rate. And you reach a point where all of these, the production rate, rate is greater than the loss rate and you can still have fractionation. You eventually reach a point where the production rate is so much 
that it cancels out any fractionation and you end up with a bulk isotope ratio that's the same as the source because there's so much more being introduced than there is being lost. So we have an upper limit based on fractionation that is shown by this chart here. But if you're introducing more methane into the atmosphere than you are losing, you have an, an, uh, uh, an amount of methane in the atmosphere that's building up over time. And you can use the current abundance of, of methane in the atmosphere to constrain that upper limit based on that production rate. And so you end up with a time scale of no more than one billion years. Otherwise, you end up with too much methane in the atmosphere to agree with the observations taken today. And this is firm evidence that you have episodic outgassing of methane because the methane that is present in the atmosphere could not have been there for more than one billion years. So each of these are model results based on different inputs. So we used four different cases. We used hydrodynamic escape, and we used sputtering. And then we used a, a current ratio of 91.1 for one of the cases, which is, I think, the stars. Yeah, the stars are 91.1. And then we used the INMS one extrapolated to the surface, which was a lower one, which would give a longer time scale, which was these circles. Yeah, and feel free to interrupt me with questions at any point because I do like taking questions during the, the, the talk. So that was our conclusion for methane. Next, we move on to nitrogen. And the question that we want to answer about nitrogen is very different from methane. And that is, how did, how did Titan acquire its nitrogen? Did it acquire its nitrogen in the form of N2 from the protosolar nebula, which was the most abundant form of nitrogen in the protosolar nebula, or which is believed to be? Or did it come from ammonia in the protosolar nebula that was later converted to N2? And in order to figure that out, we start with measurements that have been taken all across the solar system. This is one of those billion dollar charts that are, or multi billion dollar charts that have required multiple missions to, to compile all of this information. On this chart, we show the nitrogen isotope ratio for each body where it's been measured. And we, we break them into two different categories. There's primordial, which are the triangles. And those are the ones that we think represent conditions in the protosolar nebula for a constituent. So we have the measurement in the sun, or the solar wind, and Jupiter's atmosphere, which are both in agreement to have a ratio that is very depleted in the heavier, heavy isotope, so it's a very light ratio. And that is thought to be the proxy for N2 in the protosolar nebula because that's believed to be the, the dominant form of nitrogen. There were trace amounts of ammonia and HCN in the protosolar nebula that ended up freezing out into comets and being trapped in those time capsules that we later measured their isotope ratio. We used to only have HCN measurements, but recently some work has been done to get measurements for ammonia in, in various comets as well. And in both cases, they're very enriched in the heavy isotope. And we don't fully understand how they became so enriched. That's a whole different field of work. But we do, we have this as a tracer for if, it, if the nitrogen originated as ammonia, it would have a heavy isotope ratio from the beginning. So our task is to take these measurements from Titan, the N2 ratio in particular, and figure out how high that primordial ratio could be. And what we did was we started with a terrestrial ratio, see if it was possible, in any, if it was in any physical way possible to change the ratio from the terrestrial value down to the ratio that's measured in Titan's atmosphere today. Now I want to point out, so we're working on that. We've also looked at Mars because Mars started out based on measurements from meteorites that came that are thought to have come from Mars that have a nitrogen ratio similar to the terrestrial value and the current atmosphere is similar to Titan's atmosphere and evolution models have shown that it is possible at Mars to change from a terrestrial value to the the ratio that's in the atmosphere today. After I talk about that, I'm going to talk a little bit about Pluto and the current state of knowledge for that because we have a lower limit from ALMA of the nitrogen ratio in HCN that you can see 
is higher than the HCN value at Titan. So we already know that Pluto is different from Titan because its HCN is not hev as heavily enriched as the HCN in Titan's atmosphere. Am I missing? Okay, there we go. All right, so I pretty much have gone over this. Um, what the goal is, is to figure out what the highest ratio is. And we know that escape is going to take an initial ratio that is somewhere up here and move it down by increasing the amount of the heavy isotope in the atmosphere. Photochemistry, as we've seen for Titan, is going to have the opposite effect because it's pulling the heavy isotope out of N2 and moving it into HCN. It's going to cause the ratio to go up with time. So since we want to figure out how high the initial ratio would be, we focused only on escape, which is going to bring it down here, and we looked for an upper limit for what the primordial ratio could be. We looked at three different types of escape processes. One of them is hydrodynamic escape. This is very effective at removing a lot of material from the atmosphere. But as it's removing the light isotope, it's also removing the heavy isotope. So it can take a lot of material out, but it doesn't change the isotope ratio very quickly. We looked at genes escape, which is a sort of evaporation from the top of the atmosphere. And that will be more effective at changing the ratio because it will remove more of the lighter isotope. But the rates are low and so low that it takes longer than the lifetime of the solar system to change Titan's atmosphere from a terrestrial value to what we see today. And then we looked at sputtering based on possible fractionation. And it's the same case, where it's a low rate that can fractionate efficiently, but it takes longer, much longer, orders of magnitude in some cases longer than the lifetime of the solar system to change the isotope ratio in Titan's atmosphere. So it is impossible to change the ratio in Titan's atmosphere significantly over the history of the solar system. Now, that brings up the question when you compare with Mars, where models have clearly shown that it's possible to change from a value here down to here. But for Titan, we get an upper limit for the primordial ratio that is within the range for HCN in, in comets. And, and that tells us first that the origin of Titan's nitrogen had to, be H, had to be ammonia that formed in similar conditions to where comets ended up trapping ammonia as well. So the building blocks for Titan formed in conditions similar to where the building blocks for comets formed. Now that brings up the question of Mars. How can Mars change and Titan can't? And we did some looking at the equations that we use for fractionation over time and found that there is a limit to how much an isotope ratio can change from its primordial value to its current value. And that limit is as a function of the flux or the loss rate relative to the column density of that material in the atmosphere. So in Mars's atmosphere, N2 is a minor constituent that is being lost at rates relative to the amount of nitrogen in the atmosphere that's fairly high. So you can have a large change in the isotope ratio over time in Mars's atmosphere because there's not much N2 there. Whereas in Titan's atmosphere, it's this massive, thick atmosphere that requires extremely long time scales because no reasonable loss rate compared to the column density can really change the isotope ratio over time. And so there are limits that are set by how much material you have to work with. So finally, we move on to Pluto. Now that we have the New Horizons flyby and some observations of the atmosphere, and we have the ALMA observations from the, the ground-based observations of HCN in the atmosphere and a lower limit for the isotope ratio, we have a starting point to, to consider whether we can answer the same question for Pluto's atmosphere. It, how did the nitrogen originate for Pluto? Pluto formed farther out, or the building blocks for Pluto formed farther out than for Titan. Does that mean that it was cold enough to trap enough N2 and the origin of the, the nitrogen in Pluto's atmosphere is N2? Or is it like Titan, where it originated as ammonia that was later converted to N2? So what we did was we took the observations from New Horizons and modeled that, converted our Titan model to a Pluto photochemical model. 
But in order to do that, we had to add two new processes to the atmosphere, thanks to the observations of the C2 hydrocarbons and the HCN profile compared to the saturation vapor pressure in the atmosphere. Now, the C2 hydrocarbons had this inversion below 500, 400 kilometers where the haze particles in the atmosphere were starting to become important, so interaction of gas with the haze particles was going to be important. We're showing here also the saturation vapor pressure for each of these constituents, and the abundance in the atmosphere is significantly lower than the saturation vapor pressure, making it difficult for these to condense because they are subsaturated. But there's another process that's been studied for Titan that shows that collisions between molecules and the haze particles, the haze from laboratory studies has been shown when it first forms is very sticky, each of these molecules or these macromolecules. And as they age and grow larger, they harden and become less sticky. And so what we did was we had a loss rate that was a function of the collision rate of each of these molecules with the haze particles that was also a function of altitude. So it changed with altitude and became less efficient as the haze particles grew. And we found that we were able to get a reasonable agreement with the observations, assuming that these molecules were sticking to the haze in the atmosphere and being permanently lost by being physically incorporated into these sticky haze particles. Now with HCN, Alma found that it was super saturated in the upper atmosphere. So this is the saturation vapor pressure and this is the abundance in the upper atmosphere. So there was nothing for HCN in the upper atmosphere to condense onto until you get down to here and then it starts to condense out. And then you end up with an abundance that is below the saturation vapor pressure probably because it's also being lost by sticking to the aerosols. So HCN is experiencing all these crazy processes in Pluto's atmosphere that may or may not be fractionating the isotopes and may or may not influence what ALMA is able to see. And we modeled this, and our model says that the isotope ratio should be so heavy that ALMA definitely should have seen it, which means that our model doesn't capture very well these two processes, and we're working now to understand those two processes so that we can try and get an idea of what the N2 ratio must be based on that limit. So this gives us a potential current ratio. If, if Pluto's nitrogen started with an N2 ratio similar to the sun, it could be anywhere between here and here today. And if it started as ammonia, it could be anywhere between here and here today. So if we were able to measure the isotope ratio in N2, there's this zone here where we couldn't tell the difference between an origin of N2 and ammonia. And so this is our further work, and we're hoping to, to make use of this Pluto low, lower limit to try and, and narrow these uncertainties. So, yeah, and we want to go to Triton and do the same thing. So on to the last topic, which is the ice giants. And with this, <coughs> I'm going to break away from Cassini and New Horizons and start talking about the Rosetta mission um, and observations that have been made by the Rosetta mission that are relevant to a future mission to the ice giants that would hopefully, like the Galileo mission, send a probe into the atmosphere of the ice giants, measure the noble gases and ma measure the heavy elements and the isotope ratios so that we can start looking at the building blocks for the ice giants and where they came from. So I'm going to talk about the Rosetta mission. I love these comics that the European Space Agency would put together because they, they bring a lot of personality to this mission. I got, had the opportunity to work on this mission and it was one of the most enjoyable to be a part of. So it's a European Space Agency mission. It was, their, it, it was building on the heritage of the Giotto spacecraft, which did a flyby of Comet Halley and measured the composition of the ions and some of the neutrals in the coma and a lot of the plasma parameters. The Rosetta mission was designed to orbit a comet and escort the comet through perihelion and back out again from about 3.2 AU from the sun into perihelion and then back out to about the same distance. And its primary objective was to decode the history of the solar system, use a comet as a time capsule to try and understand the formation of 
of the outer solar system. It was named Rosetta because after the Rosetta Stone, which was a stone with three different types, or with the same text in three different languages that allowed linguists uh, and archaeologists to learn different languages and start decoding or start translating many different texts and was a massive groundbreaking uh, discovery in archaeology and that was the plan for the Rosetta mission to do the same sort of thing. So the Rosetta mission was a long mission. It, they started work on it in 1994. It took 10 years to develop the mission and launch it. They launched in 2004 and this shows the uh, path from launch. In 2004, it went through three gravity assists at Earth, one gravity assist at Mars, and then did two asteroid flybys on its way out into the outer solar system, past the, or around to the orbit of Jupiter. Now, Rosetta was powered entirely by solar panels. So it got far enough out in the solar system to where they couldn't continue to operate the spacecraft, and they put it into hibernation for about two years. And that was one of the scarier times for us because in about 2013, we sent a signal to the spacecraft to wake up. And fortunately it did, and we had a mission. And we managed to encounter the comet in 2014 had a la did mapping of the surface, had a lander sent to the surface that bounced twice. <laughs> and, but we got a lot of good data from the lander, and then the orbiter stayed with the comet for almost two years, taking in situ observations of how the coma composition changed over time and taking a lot of images of the surface to see how the surface changed over time as well. Now, this mission had a lot of different surprises. When we were on our way to the comet, we didn't really know what the comet would look like. The best thing we had were observations with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is one of the coolest missions ever. But this is the best that we could get from the Hubble Space Telescope. Based on those observations, it looked like it would be maybe diamond-shaped, a little blobby. And when we got there with the navigation camera and started taking these images, this is the rotation of the comet as it, we were approaching it, and it was nothing like what we expected. It looked like a duck. <laughs> and that ended up being our mascot for the rest of the mission. We started calling it the ducky, and we would reference certain points on the head, or certain points on the backside, or the CO2 is coming out of the bottom of the duck. <laughs> and it ended up being a really fun mission to work on, just because we were studying a, something that looked like a rubber ducky. Um, one of the things that, we had a lot of fun with it too. <laughs> one of the things that we would do is we would make a shape model so that we could use that shape model to try and study different interactions. Like you, you could take a shape model and then shine a light on it and you could figure out at certain points what parts of the surface was illuminated and what parts of the surface were not illuminated. And that would help us to figure out the outgassing rate from different areas and whether different areas were producing more CO2 or more water, and that's something we're still trying to fully sort out, but we even had fun with that. So um, this mission was groundbreaking because it had a mass spectrometer that was able to measure noble gas abundances in a comet, and this is the first ever measurement of noble gas abundances in a comet. It also measured the isotope ratios of xenon, krypton, and argon in the comet. So we have not just the noble gas abundances relative to water, but we also have the noble gas isotope ratios from comparisons with, with other objects in the solar system. Now a problem that we have, see we look at these noble gas measurements in Jupiter's atmosphere, these are abundances relative to hydrogen which we use so that we can compare with conditions in the protosolar nebula, which is, was predominantly hydrogen. And the bulk of Jupiter's atmosphere is hydrogen, so that is a justified comparison in order to look at whether Jupiter's enriched in heavy elements and why and what the contributions of other building blocks were. But when you're taking a measurement from a comet, and if you take that relative to hydrogen, you're taking that relative to hydrogen coming from water, because in a comet, the bulk of the hydrogen is coming from water. And that's not a very good comparison to conditions in the protosolar nebula. 
So what we had to first do if we wanted to take these measurements from the comet and compare that to the gas giants is find a different comparison measurement other than hydrogen that would be able to give us some reference to either the, um, the gas or to the solid material that went into the, the gas giants. So we looked at carbon and nitrogen because we have carbon measurements for all four of the gas giants, so we had something there. And with Uranus and Neptune, we've recently learned about an upper limit for nitrogen in the, the ice giants, so we have something of a reference there, and that's shown here. And then we have measurements for Saturn's atmosphere and for Jupiter. So we have enough measurements for the, the giant planets to start doing some comparisons with this one single comet. And so what we did was we took the measurements of the noble gases in Jupiter's atmosphere, in chondrites, which is this gray here, in the comet, and then what we know about helium for Saturn and the ice giants, and compared them to carbon here and to nitrogen here and relative to the protosolar values. So we took like argon to nitrogen in the comet and argon to nitrogen in the protosolar nebula based on the pub publication by Lauders et al., which is an estimate for the solar value. And we took that and we found that um, relative to carbon, everything is mostly depleted except for xenon in, in um, chondrites. So if you measure things relative to carbon and it's depleted, that really doesn't tell you anything about the building blocks that contributed to the ice giants or to Jupiter. And we're, we're mainly focusing on ice giants because we're hoping to send a mission there and we want to have a model for how to interpret the observations once they're available. Now, if you take the ref them relative to nitrogen, then you have a little bit more differentiation between the sources. Like in chondrites, they're significantly enriched relative to nitrogen compared to the protosolar nebula. In comets, krypton and xenon are, significant, are enriched relative to the protosolar nebula, but argon is depleted relative to the solar protosolar nebula in nitrogen. So it looks like nitrogen would be an important way of separating what the sources were for the solid material that went into forming the ice giants when they formed. Now the other data point that we have from Rosetta, the krypton isotopes are similar to the, the, the protosolar value, but the xenon isotopes were extremely surprising. What I'm showing here is the xenon isotopes um, that were measured at Jupiter by the Galileo probe relative to the solar value. So it's scaled relative to 132, I think. And the, I don't know if it's 132, but it's scaled relative to, the solar, to each other and to the solar value. And within the error bars, for the most part, Jupiter's xenon isotopes were pretty close to solar. Chondrites are fairly close to solar as well. They're enriched in the heavier isotope comparatively. Um, but comets are very different. They're very enriched in 129 and then extremely depleted in the two heaviest isotopes. And so this shows a, po a potential different source for the xenon that ended up in this comet in particular because we only have one data point, so we have to be careful not to apply it to every comet and assume that every comet's the same. But this is an interesting measurement that if we measure the xenon isotopes in the ice giants and it shows also this depletion, then the building blocks for, that went into forming the ice giants could have been formed in the same way and in the same location as the building blocks for this comet. So this is an important and useful tracer. So we create four scenarios based on these potential observations that would tell us what measurements in the ice giant's atmosphere would mean for the building blocks that went into helping to form the ice giants. And so in summary, the volatile acquisition and retention is important for a planet to support life. It's also important to understand the history of the solar system. And we can't ignore the fact that atmospheres evolve. So if you're looking at measurements from a secondary atmosphere, don't assume that that measurement is what is representative of how that atmosphere formed. You have to consider the evolution of the atmosphere. 
And then doing comparative planetology within the solar system is very valuable. I think it's also very valuable to extend this to exoplanets and compare our solar system knowledge to exoplanets and really start building that da database for comparative planetology. And I will just end with this video because the other thing that I love about the Rosetta mission is it operated like no other mission that I've ever had the chance to work on. When you're orbiting Saturn, the gravity of Saturn drives everything. When you're orbiting a comet, there's almost no gravity. If you get outside of 30 kilometers, you're no longer in orbit because it's just this tiny object. So, but we had to go beyond 30 kilometers for the space safety of the spacecraft once the comet was very active. So we had some of the most interesting trajectories with the spacecraft. It's the only one I've ever seen that makes a solid right turn in space. <laughs> and we did this through the entire mission. We actually brought enough fuel with to do all of these op operations. There's even one point where um, the spacecraft saved because we went in for a close flyby. And for some reason, nobody realized that dust coming off of the comet would look like stars and confuse the star tracker. And then the, the spacecraft star tracker would get lost and shut down the entire spacecraft because it didn't know if it was going to smash into something. So, and I think that's about here. And so we went from this wonderful plan that we had been putting in two years into planning and had to throw everything away and start over and plan by the seat of our pants, which Isa kept telling us, we can't do this. And we actually proved that they can plan in short amount of times. And it was, it was quite the adventure. It was a lot of fun working on this mission. So I'll take any questions that you have while this is playing. Um, the only work that I've done on Mars is to show that it's different from Titan. Uh, there are people who have done a lot of work on that, and I'm not sure whether they've actually used it to figure out an initial inventory, but I would expect that they have, because it would make sense. It would be kind of silly not to. <laughs> and I know they've done really good work, so I'm assuming that they have, but I don't know. Yeah, we mainly focused on outer solar system atmospheres. And we just had somebody that kept saying to me, well, what about Mars? Mars can change. Titan can't. You're lying. <laughs> and so I had to figure out why Mars was different. And it, it was actually a useful exercise to figure out why Mars was different than Titan and kind of validate my own work by comparing it with another planet. But yeah, I haven't worked much on Mars. I saw a hand back there. Yeah. So the one who, originate, or who originally published this did look into mass-dependent fractionation processes and found that this pattern of fractionation just can't be explained by any mass-dependent pro process. So they concluded, based on a lack of a process that's mass-dependent to explain it, that this is primordial and it comes from a different source of xenon. Now, this is a fairly new result, so other people have not really taken a deeper look at this. So it is possible that, it, that maybe there was some process that did or cause this fractionation. For the conclusion for the ice giants, though, uh, whatever process caused this type of trapping of the xenon isotopes, if it affected the building blocks for the ice giants in the same way, then we could say that the building blocks for the ice giants had a similar source as the comet's building blocks. And so the data for the chondrites, is that from, from the chondrites, type B um, chondrites, do you know? 
I would have. I would have to look that up. That's a good question. So uh, I want to get back to your billion dollar diagram and the <laughs> This one's one too. When you're compiling results from multiple, multiple missions, you basically end up with billion dollar <laughs> graphs, multi billion so dollar. Mm -hmm. and, and yes. Is that the type of aspect of value from HCM or yeah. nitrogen? Or, I mean, it certainly depends on mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is for HCM and comets. And that error bar shows the, the range of values that have been reported from different comets. And then this one is from ammonia. And I think there was one that took an average of 15, 14 or 15 comets. And then there was an observation in comet ISON. And then a more recent paper that gave a range in about uh, several other comets. And they're all within this value range. No. Um, Rosetta has been working on the nitrogen isotopes, yeah. and it has been difficult because they don't have any direct measurements of 14N and 15N. So what they're trying to do is take the 15N atom and pull an N2 isotope ratio out of that. And I think that's a really complicated thing because you have to understand how it's breaking apart in the instrument and you have to be able to account for every nitrogen bearing species that's entering your instrument and breaking apart and releasing 15N. And so they have not published these results because it is very complex, the analysis. Yes. For a comment. Yeah, and then we have no way of separating, <laughs> if that's the case, yes. Yeah, right now we are basing it on the assumption that this is what represents N2 in the protosolar nebula until we have more data. Mm -hmm. What does that actually mean in the big picture? Does that mean that the methane we see now is of that time scale? Does it mean yeah. that we had methane for that long? What, what yeah. does it mean? Yeah, it basically means that Titan has only had methane in the atmosphere or enough methane to, to basically have a presence in the atmosphere for no more than one billion years. And yeah, so... Titan was very different a billion years ago because a methane-free atmosphere would be a very different temperature. It's the heating or it's the, the greenhouse effect of methane that is causing the temperature on the surface to be such that you can have methane rain and methane lakes. And without methane in the atmosphere, you'd have a very thin N2 atmosphere, probably similar to Pluto's or, or Triton's. They're just very cold and less chemistry. Yeah, it's an interior process that, uh, well, the theory is that the methane is coming from the interior and being re released by cryovolcanic activity. Now, we were talking in lunch about how there's one feature on the surface of Titan that they think is a cryovolcano. So <laughs> there's no evidence for cryovolcanic outgassing of methane. It's just theorized as what the source must be. Now we don't have a very good, the, the mapping of the surface is using the radar and then using windows through the haze where you can see the surface in different wavelengths. So we don't have the surface data that we have for the Earth or for other planets. I think it's probably more like Venus where you're peeking through thick clouds and trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. Given yeah. how Yeah, I think um, there is a lot of value in 
particularly now where we're getting to the stage with exoplanets of wanting to not just discover them and figure out their mass and radius, but actually characterizing them. I think now is the time where the solar system community and the exoplanet community need to start talking and start working together and figure out where these uncertainties are and sharing data and sharing models and working together because it's been hard to learn about our own solar system. Pluto was a huge surprise with the New Horizons flyby. They figured that the, meth the nitrogen would be escaping rapidly, the upper atmosphere would be warm enough to sustain escape, and they got there and found there were unpredicted cooling processes that was keeping the atmosphere hydrostatic and not escaping. And, and so we think we know things, and then we go out to a place and we find out that we there's a lot we didn't know. We need to remember that with exoplanets and apply what we do know to that and work together as a community.